Um, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Mad Crash Course series. We'll be doing the finals series on obstetrics today, taught by Aisha, who is an ONG trainee. So in the top right hand corner, we have our QR code for our Instagram page. So please do scan and follow if you aren't already. And in the bottom left corner is our email. So if you have any questions that you think of later on, please do email us and we can always forward it to whoever's presenting. Go on to the next slide. So this is the QR code for our polls and I'll post a link in the chat as well. So please scan and it's completely anonymous. So please do give the questions a go. And if you want to go for it. Perfect. Ash. Thank you so much, um, Ash. Um, so my name is Aisha. I am currently an OBS and Gynae ST1 at um, Northwick Park in Northwest London based. I studied at Imperial and I'm very much interested in medical education, hence why I'm doing this today. Um, just a small disclaimer, obviously the contents of the slides are not going to be completely comprehensive to, um, uh, to, to necessarily to your curriculum, but it is in line with the GMC curriculum and the MLA content map. So um, please use it um, as a guide and as a revision sort resource, but do look at your own university syllabus to be able to um, get a better overview on this um, because finals may vary from university to university. Um, it is also kind of tight for time. So at the end of the day, I can only put so much in there, but I'll try to make it as high yield as I possibly could. Just to give you a brief outline, um, I've kind of split this into four different um, sections. So antenatal care and medical conditions and pregnancy, followed by obstetric emergencies, labor and delivery, and the postpartum period. And you'll just see that kind of come up so you kind of have an idea of the time frame that we're kind of running at based on this. Right. So we can get kick started with the first section. So this is the first SBA. I've opened the poll out. Um, please do try and answer the question um, and we can go through the answers afterwards. So a 40 year old woman presents to her first antenatal clinic appointment as she's recently found out she's pregnant. Her last menstrual period was 15 weeks ago and so she's concerned that she's no longer eligible for Down syndrome screening. What appropriate screening test do you counsel her on? Just a few more seconds. Um, if I can just say, I, th I think some people are putting the options in the chat. Um, oh, okay. I'll repost the link for the polls again. If you can do it on that, it's completely anonymous and it just helps kind of keep track of who's voting as well, like how many people are voting. OK. Sorry, this is my first time using this. So you'll, you'll have to bear with me. Um, There should be a stop poll on there. Yeah, there is a stop poll in there. Mm -hmm. OK. So. so you can all see the correct answer. So 
The reason it's a quadruple screening test, um, an E, which includes the relevant um, hormone tests that are used, is because her last menstrual period is 15 weeks ago. And so she would have um, missed the combined screening test, um, which would be uh, the answer B. Um, so effectively, that's why that's the most appropriate screening test to counsel her on at the moment. So she is still eligible for screening. Um, as some of you may know, the quadruple screening test isn't as sensitive as a combined screening test. And sometimes they do like to throw that one in there because it is a little bit different. It can differentiate between different candidates. But obviously the most common one to really know about is the combined screening test, which is done between 11 and 13 plus six weeks. So the second SBA. So a 40 year old woman presents to her first booking appointment. She's recently found out she's pregnant. What examination and investigations would you perform at this stage? So the correct answer is A. Um, so this is again kind of just general knowledge that you um, need to know a little bit about antenatal care. Um, it is her first booking appointment and it's both examination and investigation. So in this case, BMI and blood pressure, urine dip tend to be the common ones that are done there and then. And then bloods are usually taken, which include a full blood count, a group and save because you want to know the recess status of the mother to know whether or not you need to give um, any um, anti-D and you want to test for infections, so HIV, syphilis and hepatitis B. And finally, it's sickle cell and thalassemia screening. In terms of the other options, um, we no longer screen for rubella um, and we don't tend to screen for group B strep, although there is um, some massive trials that are looking into whether or not um, it, there is a cost benefit uh, to screening for group B strep. Fine. So last one before we get into a little bit of um, a little bit of teaching. So uh, again, 40 year old woman um, presents her GP. She's recently found out she's pregnant. She has depression and is currently on sertraline 100 milligrams once a day. What advice would you give her with regards to her medication? Okay, hopefully that's enough time. So the correct answer is D, 
So sertraline is actually um, known to, uh, is actually no longer, um, has recently been disproven to uh, its link to congenital heart defects, but the remaining options of autism spectrum disorder, low birth weight and preterm labour are actually correctly linked. Um, the risk is, however, very, very small. Um, ultimately, sertraline can prevent um, and even reduce unpleasant symptoms that can obviously happen in mental health conditions. So it's important um, to uh, realise that the benefits of taking the medication generally outweigh the risks. Um, so in this case, you would want to continue the sertraline for this lady. Fine. So um, just to give you a brief idea about the antenatal care timeline, um, usually it is split between first, second and third trimester. So the first trimester is from well, zero to um, 12 weeks, the second between 13 and 28 weeks, and then from 29 to 41 weeks onwards, it is um, considered to be the third trimester. Generally speaking, women find out, uh, hopefully, under 10 weeks of gestation and will have had their booking appointment by that point, um, which is the initial appointment which covers the education, the lifestyle, nutrition, aspects of physical and mental health that are important in pregnancy, as well as um, measuring things like BMI, blood pressure, urine dip, as well as the blood test that we discussed earlier on. Um, the important things to note is that there are two key scans um, in pregnancy if it is uncomplicated. The first being the anomaly, uh, apologies, the um, nuchal scan or nuchal translucency scan. Um, and that A confirms pregnancy um, and B allows you to perform the combined screening test. Um, it gives you a rough gestational age with the most accurate estimated date of delivery and it also can confirm whether or not it's a singleton or multiple pregnancy as well. The second scan that's usually offered is between kind of 18 to 20 weeks and it's the anomaly scan and as the name suggests it screens for any congenital defects that may be obvious on a scan. Obviously not all congenital defects can be seen through ultrasound um, and finally it does determine the placental location um, and if it's obviously not low then we don't need to do any further scanning from that point of view. Um, generally speaking, women in their first pregnancy will have a few extra scan, um, a few extra midwifery appointments if, again, they are low risk. Um, but otherwise, um, the the appointments are kind of listed on the antenatal care timeline. This is actually from Teach Me OBGYN, which um, is a very good website that gives you a nice overview on common conditions um, and can give you. Um, lots of information. So I think this particular timeline is quite useful to know. The important things are really what is done in the booking appointment, at what point can you offer combined screening tests and quadruple screening tests, what time sh should the scans be done, which we talked about 11 to 14 weeks and 18 to 20 weeks for the anomaly scan, and 28 weeks tends to be the important point for rechecking bloods such as full blood count, group, group and um, rhesus status, giving anti-D, and also things like an oral glucose tolerance test is done roughly around this gestation. We obviously know that term is defined between 37 and 41 weeks. Um, and so it's kind of important to just remember that anything above 41 weeks, we would count as post dates and generally encourage people to deliver at this point due to the significant risk of stillbirth. So we'll move on to the next set of SBAs. So a 42 year old woman presents to a GP. She's recently found out she's pregnant. She takes Ramipril for essential hypertension. She intends to continue with the pregnancy. So what advice would you give her? 
Five more seconds. Okay. So the correct answer is C, stop the ramipril and start libitalol. So obviously we know that she is pregnant. She's taking ramipril for essential hypertension. Hopefully at this point you would have worked out that ramipril is teratogenic. And so we generally don't use it in pregnancy uh, due to the risks of um, um, uh, defects with the renal system. Um, so we generally tend to stop the ramipril. The first line antihypertensive in pregnancy um, is labetalol. So the best option here would be to start labetalol and GPs can actually do this themselves. So that's the other important thing to remember is that she's at the GP practice. The other one that generally can um, be considered in this case is stopping ramipril or starting labetalol and maybe considering aspirin. Um, but again, it, she would have to be risk assessed. She probably would pass a risk assessment and require aspirin. But again, that would only be given from 12 weeks onwards. And so you don't need to give it from um, this gestation that's listed in the question. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll move on to the next one. So 28 year old Primip sent in by her midwife to maternity triage at 34 weeks pregnant due to an incidental finding of a blood pressure of 170 over 100. She reports no symptoms. She's had an uncomplicated pregnancy so far. Her urine dipstick is positive for two pluses of protein. You suspect preeclampsia and you send off some blood tests and a urine protein creatinine ratio. What would be the first step in your management plan? Five more seconds. So in this case, we would admit and start oral libitalol. Um, so the reason I've highlighted Primip in this case is because being a Primip is a risk factor to actually developing preeclampsia. She's in her third trimester, which is when it's most likely to occur, and the blood pressure is significantly high at 170 over 100. So it meets the threshold for treatment, which is roughly 150 over 100. So she's asymptomatic. And she does have evidence of protein in her urine, even if we don't have a formal urine PCR or urine protein creatinine ratio. So the first step in the management plan really is to admit this lady and start oral libitalol because you've already started taking off blood, taking bloods. So realistically, we want to start some treatment for her. The reason you would admit is because you want to make sure that the medication is working for her. Um, and so generally speaking, we tend to admit these women um, on the offset uh, and on the first presentation. Moving on to the next one. So in this case, you've got a 45 year old primate who's conceived via IVF. She presents to the antenatal clinic at 28 weeks gestation with an incidental finding of a blood pressure of 142 over 94 and a one plus of protein in her urine. The urine PCR comes back as 19. She says that her blood pressure is often high when she visits her GP. What is the most likely diagnosis? <laughs> 
five more seconds. Okay. So um, in this case, the answer here would be pregnancy induced hypertension. Um, so she has a few risk factors. Uh, the first one of which is her age. So she's 45 and she's a primip. We did mention this and it, she uses she used assisted reproductive techniques, so IVF to conceive. She's 28 weeks in gestation, so she's more than 20 weeks. And she had a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. One plus of protein can be um, significant, but actually it's only significant for preeclampsia if the urine protein creatinine ratio is actually more than 30. And in this case, it's 19. It's likely that she may end up developing preeclampsia later on in her pregnancy, but currently she would not qualify as um, saying that she's got preeclampsia. Um, it could be white coat syndrome, but we can't um, we can't simply put that as a most likely diagnosis when she is pregnant because you can't rule out um, pregnancy induced hypertension. Realistically, if the question asked you what would be your next step, it would probably be to complete a blood pressure profile because then you get a better idea of what her blood pressure readings are actually doing. So just to quickly go over, generally speaking, um, blood pressure issues in pregnancy. So you can have chronic hypertension, which is long-standing hypertension with a blood pressure of more than 140 over 90, which generally exists before 20 weeks of pregnancy. So sometimes you'll get questions which ask you um, about a woman who's come in at 16 weeks gestation or 14 weeks gestation with an incident of finding of a high blood pressure. And generally speaking, these women are most likely to be people who have had chronic hypertension but have not been made aware of the diagnosis. Um, pregnancy induced hypertension, generally speaking, is um, similarly to preeclampsia, the blood pressure is more than 140 over 90 and it tends to recur after 20 weeks of gestation. Whereas preeclampsia really refers to a new hypertension, um, which um, is associated with end organ dysfunction. In this case, it is most commonly associated with proteinuria. There are some risk factors and they exist for both PIH and PET. So if you've had previous PIH or PET in um, pregnancy before, um, if you've got certain autoimmune diseases or chronic conditions such as diabetes. And if you've got a family history of PT, um, have an age greater than 40, as it was in this case, or a BMI greater than 35, if you're a primip or more than 10 years since your last pregnancy, or if you are someone who is having twins or triplets, etc. Generally speaking, symptoms are the ones that we do screen for. So hopefully you are aware of these, which are kind of headache, visual disturbances, nausea, vomiting. Generally, right upper quadrant and epigastric pain is what we look for, as well as edema. Um, you will often find that there may be reduced urine output in severe cases of preeclampsia, as well as brisk reflexes. The whole point of it, regardless of what type of blood pressure issue it is, is to try and aim for a blood pressure le less than 135 over 85. And as we spoke about before, labetalol is generally used as the first line. Nifedipine would then be your second line and methyl dopa would be your third line. You will only use IV um, medications when it's severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, or even PIH, which is symptomatic. Um, so it's not very common. We always tend to admit women um, who have blood pressure issues of more than 160 over 110 or people who need um, treatment or meet the treatment threshold for the first time. And you tend to monitor these women weekly in um, the day assessment unit. Obviously complications that uh, we worry about our HELP syndrome. So um, uh, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets um, and eclampsia. So generally speaking, seizures. And 
prophylactic treatment, which we alluded to in one of the previous questions in the antenatal care section, is that we use aspirin from 12 weeks of pregnancy um, following a risk assessment of, of, of their um, pregnancy. You may have heard of something called PLGF, um, which is now a new thing that has come into um, screening. It's used as testing on one occasion only, and hopefully you shouldn't be asked anything about it, but just good to be aware about it, the blood test that can be used to predict um, severity of preeclampsia. So we'll move on to the next question. Please do feel free to put in any questions on the on the chat um, or even speak up if you do have any questions or something doesn't make sense. So in this case, we've got a 35 year old primate. She attends antenatal clinic. She's had an OGTT, which shows a fasting blood glucose of 7.1 and a blood glucose of 8.4 after two hours. A diagnosis of gestational diabetes is made. What would be your first step in management? Again, five more seconds. Okay, so in this case, we are talking about um, diet and exercise changes as well as insulin. Um, so the reason for this is actually predominantly due to the fact that she has um, a fasting blood glucose of more than 7.1. Um, so when you look at the guideline that's most recently come out, um, it effectively shows that um, anything more than um, seven should really be treated with diet and exercise changes as well as insulin plus minus metformin. So I think I've got another slide on this actually. Um, generally speaking, between two and five percent of pregnancies are affected by gestational diabetes um, in pregnancy um, and obviously that has maternal and fetal risks as well. So we'll move on to the next one. So you've got another 35 year old, um, but she's a known diabetic who had a vaginal delivery yesterday. During the newborn infant and physical examination, the midwife noticed, notices an asymmetrical moral reflex. Which of the following most likely explains this finding. Okay, so in this case, the correct answer is shoulder dystocia. Um, so this is alluding to one of the most important, well, generally speaking, one of the most known uh, complications of um, having diabetes in pregnancy, which is the risk of shoulder dystocia. Um, we will talk about shoulder dystocia slightly later on in the presentation. So for now, I'll just skip through that. Hopefully that makes sense. So we'll go for the next one. We've got another 22 year old diabetic who's had her second baby delivered by cesarean section at 36 weeks due to fetal macrosomia and poor blood sugar control. The operation was straightforward with no immediate complications. She is currently on an insulin sliding scale running when you review her on the ward 12 hours post-operatively. On review, she's eating and drinking and beginning to mobilize. So what would be the next step in management? Give you a few more seconds to think about the answer. Okay. 
Okay. So the correct answer is C, so stopping the sliding scale and changing her back to her pre-pregnancy insulin and oral hypoglycemic regimen. So the reason for this is that she's a type 1 diabetic um, and she was on an insulin sliding scale for the delivery process because she wouldn't normally be eating and drinking during that time and she's had a cesarean section in this case, so an operation. Generally speaking, these women will be eating six hours, roughly six hours post-operatively. Um, and so once they're eating and drinking, actually, she can just be switched back to her pre-pregnancy um, insulin. Um, generally, they're not on oral hypoglycemic regimens. To be fair, that's usually type 2 diabetics. But in this case, the best answer is, um, is actually the pre-pregnancy insulin uh, and oral hypoglycemic regimen. We wouldn't put her back onto her insulin regimen during pregnancy, nor would we half her pre-pregnancy insulin dosing because that will just not cover her and she's likely to then develop hyperglycemia at a later stage. So again, we carry on with the diabetic theme. So we've got 22 year old type one diabetic who wants to become pregnant. She's been monitoring her blood sugars and her latest HbA1c is 48. As her GP, what preconception care and advice would you provide? There will be a few, five more seconds. OK. So as most of you got it correct, the answer is A. Um, so she's young, she's a type 1 diabetic. So with any diabetic, um, we want to make sure that they are fully aware of the risks and trying to optimize their glycemic control prior to becoming pregnant. Um, in this case, her HbA1c is at target, so 48. Um, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to start her on five milligrams of folic acid and just making sure that her renal and retinal assessment are up to date. Um, you don't need to necessarily increase her insulin regimen unless there was any indication in the question to think that actually she's not controlling her blood sugar as well. Um, and again, it probably would be a bit extreme to say that she shouldn't get pregnant until her renal and retinal assessment are completed um, for this reason as well. So, Diabetes and pregnancy, um, like I said, I've just put a, a few um, uh, bits of information on there, um, which include things like what it becomes the definition of it. The best way to remember the fasting and post oral glucose tolerance test is remembering that it's five, six, seven, eight. Um, so hopefully you might know that. And the targets, unfortunately, don't help you very much because the fasting target is 5.3. So that's just messing up things. But generally speaking, um, anything lower than kind of your 5.6 and your 7.8 for fasting in two hours post 75 grams of glucose tend to be generally accurate. Um, as we spoke about with pre-existing diabetes, you want to make sure that they have good glycemic control and that they are taking folic acid preconception because they are at higher risk of neural, tu neural tubal defects. Um, and their targets um, remain the same, whether they have pre-existing diabetes or GDM. Um, generally speaking, women with type 2, type 2 diabetes need to be switched on to insulin and metformin regimens and other oral hypoglycemics generally tend to be stopped because we know very little about their effects in pregnancy. Although sulfonylureas are starting to make um, some impact into the, the um, uh, regimens for people who are not tolerant of metformin. 
Risk factors um, that I've mentioned on there are actually the risk factors that are listed by NICE that would qualify you to have an OGTT at 28 weeks. The symptoms are very similar um, as the, to those um, who develop diabetes outside of pregnancy as well. Um, and generally speaking, as we spoke about with regards to the treatment, we would if the fasting glucose is less than seven, then we can just trial diet and exercise for one to two weeks. And after that, if it's still not under control, consider metformin and insulin. But actually, if the fasting glucose is more than seven, then you'd actually you'd actually want to start insulin plus minus metformin. Because of the risk of um, fetal macrosomia, um, we generally tend to do four weekly scans and two weekly clinic follow-ups uh, with consultant-led care because they're now considered high risk if they do develop gestational diabetes or alternatively if they have pre-existing diabetes. Um, the complication side of things um, is generally more in relation to gestational diabetes because those with pre-existing diabetes are more likely to develop um, congenital defects or even IUGR babies. Um, and obviously the 50% increased risk of development of type 2 diabetes is in reference to um, GDM as well. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll move on to obstetric emergencies. So we're now on two of four. Um, so the next question is with reference to the recent Embrace report, uh, which was published on maternal morbidity and mortality data during the 2018 to 2020 period in the UK. It was found that women were three times more likely to die from suicide during or up to six weeks postpartum in comparison to previous years. What is the leading direct cause of maternal death? Okay, so in this case, um, you didn't actually need to know very much about what an embrace report is, although it is mothers and babies reducing the risk um, through audits and confidential inquiries. So it is a very famous report that pretty much every obstetrician reads um, and they publish data yearly or biannually on maternal morbidity and mortality. And in this case, um, the thrombosis and thromboembolism remains the leading cause of death um, during and up to six weeks um, after the end of pregnancy, which is quite shocking. Um, the next question is about a 37 year old who is on her seventh pregnancy with a BMI of 38. She, re she presents to maternity triage at 30 weeks gestation reporting breathlessness and chest pain. An ABG shows a pH of 7.55, a PO2 of 9, a PCO2 of 4.7 and a base excess of 1.9. What is the next most appropriate investigation? Five more seconds. OK, so this was a bit of a difficult one um, because in pregnancy, things are a little bit different. So given the information that we have here, she's 37. She's got her seventh pregnancy and she's got a high BMI. So she's got various risk factors for developing a PE in pregnancy. 
she also presents with symptoms that are classical of PE, so breathlessness and chest pain. And we know that she's um, hypoxic. Um, and also, oh, sorry, apologies, I, I changed, I may have made a mistake with the pH, but she's got a respiratory alkalosis in any case. Um, the next, the important bit in the question is to look at the next most appropriate investigation. In pregnancy, we want to use the lowest dose of ionizing radiation as possible. So actually, the first thing you would do is a chest X-ray because you want to rule out other causes for breathlessness and chest pain. In this case, you'd be looking for um, things like a pneumonia being present on the chest X-ray or if there's any signs of something else leading to the cause of her symptoms. A CTPA and a VQ scan tend to be um, what you would want to opt for to confirm a diagnosis of um, PE, um, but it wouldn't necessarily be the next pregnant, uh, the next um, most appropriate step. Oh, I think somebody asked a question. Is VQ scan used in pregnancy instead of a CTPA? So um, generally speaking, um, it is still a fairly debated topic. If you are asked a question, I would normally put down um, a VQ scan. The reason being that actually it has the lowest radiation dose and is net, generally speaking preferred. But to be honest, because um, CTPA ha, ha, is effectively the gold standard, if a VQ scan is negative um, and you still have a high index of suspicion, you then would proceed with a CTPA. So yes, the answer is VQ scan you use in pregnancy, but actually the gold standard is, is still CTPA. D-dimer would be raised in pregnancy, so it's absolutely useless in this case. And bilateral ultrasound leg Dopplers um, are useful in trying to identify clots. So Sometimes what we would do is um, if this woman were to come in, we're still suspecting um, a PE, the chest X-ray is normal, is we might try and do ultrasound leg Dopplers at this stage to see if we can find a clot. If the clot is present in the leg Dopplers, then we don't need to proceed with higher radiation um, procedures like a VQ scan or a CTPA because we would effectively still be treating with um, treatment dose, low molecular weight heparin. Um, I got this off the internet actually, and it does give you um, a very nice brief overview of how um, we go about um, investigating um, venous thromboembolism in pregnancy. So if we think that there might be a clot somewhere, whether that's the legs or the lungs, we start on treatment dose low molecular weight heparin during our workup, which will include bloods, um, but not a D-dimer. Um, we generally look also at leg Dopplers, as I mentioned. If they're positive, then you continue um, the uh, the anticoagulant therapy. But if they're negative, then you need to do serial ultrasounds. Um, if it's a DVT, if it's a PE, then you need to proceed to a VQ scan and ultimately a CTPA. Generally speaking, we do counsel these women on the risk of each of the two. Um, options. Um, in most hospitals, you'll find CTPAs are more accessible. So actually, we tend to prefer them to opt for those. But obviously, the risk is higher in different ways. So we'll move on to the next one. 32-year-old woman attends a maternity triage with an antepartum hemorrhage of 50 mils and abdominal pain. She's 34 weeks pregnant in her first pregnancy and her 20-week scan revealed a posterior fundal placenta. She admits that her and her partner had intercourse last night. What's the most likely diagnosis? Hopefully this one should be fairly straightforward. Um, although I did, I did not make the questions very easy, um, mainly because they're good learning um, opportunities, um, and it doesn't matter if you get them wrong now. The whole point is that you should be getting them wrong now and getting them right later on. 
OK, so I'm going to stop the poll. Um, so the correct answer here is actually a placental abruption. So this is a 32 year old. She's come in with an antepartum hemorrhage and she's got abdominal pain. So the first thing any time someone talks about vaginal bleeding in pregnancy is do they have pain or not? If it is, um, you know, vasa previa or even placenta previa, they are generally um, presenting as painless bleeds. Vasa previa is rare. It occurs usually at the time of rupture of membranes and usually you see some sudden fetal compromise at the time. Placenta previa is obviously characteristically presenting as a painless bleed, but we know that in this case the placenta is not low. Placenta accreta, placenta percreta is often associated um, um, with um, other things like previous cesarean section scars um, and previous surgery. So it's unlikely to be the case in this one because we have no indication to think that she's had previous surgery. And the other thing is that um, actually you tend to be, you tend to find a diagnosis of accreta and percreta on ultrasound. Um, and if not on ultrasound, then when you're delivering the placentas, when you tend to find it. So actually the most likely diagnosis in this case is a placental abruption. So a separation of the placenta from the wall of the uterus. There are a few risk factors. Um, and the most common one that people know about is smoking and chronic conditions like high blood pressure. Um, but actually um, being a primip um, is technically a risk factor as well. Unfortunately, abruptions tend to be fairly unpredictable and the risk factors are there, but sometimes they may just happen. They are life threatening to both mother and child, so they need to be diagnosed quickly and acted upon quite quickly as well. So we'll move on to the next one. So midwife calls you about a 21 year old who's got CTG concerns. It's her second pregnancy via IVF. Her 20 week anomaly ultrasound revealed a high posterior placenta. A VE was performed by the midwife prior to attending. She was six centimeters dilated and she had a spontaneous rupture of membranes following this examination. You notice a small amount of dark blood on her pad. What is the most likely diagnosis? I'll give you another five seconds because hopefully this one's fairly clear from my explanation of the previous answer. So um, in this case, yes, it's vasa previa. As I spoke about, it's generally painless bleeding. So we know that there is dark blood. There's no mention of pain. And we know that she was six centimeters dilated and there's CTG concerns at the time of rupture of membranes. So it's very much in fitting with vasa previa. It's not a very common condition, but they tend to like asking this question in SBAs. So the next question is about a 30 year old primate who attends triage at 30 weeks pregnant with minor unprovoked painless bleeding from the vagina at about 10 mils. Her anomaly scan at 20 weeks shows a low lying placenta. The fetus is moving well and the continuous cardiotocography, so CCTG is reassuring. What's the most appropriate management plan? So we've discussed about the different types of vaginal bleeding in pregnancy. Um, hopefully this one should be fairly straightforward. Right, so this one is we would admit take bloods, including a group and save, and ensure that there's IV access, monitor for further bleeding, and only give steroids if there is any evidence of further bleeding. So um, this lady has placenta previa. Anyone who comes in with bleeding in pregnancy, generally speaking, we admit them for 24 hours if they've got evidence of ongoing vaginal bleeding. 
um, even if everything else seems to be reassuring because um, anything can happen. And generally speaking, we know that there is a risk of re-bleeding in the first 24 hours of um, a bleed itself. We obviously don't keep everyone. So if there's no evidence of bleeding, when you examine them, you can send them home with um, safety netting advice. But in this case, because we know that she's had some bleeding, um, and we don't have enough information about what the examination findings were, we would have to keep her in, make sure that she's got um, a, a group and save in place in case she needs blood, um, and uh, we would monitor for further bleeding. Um, this is a nice table, hopefully when you can have a, a bit more time to have a look at this. Um, it tells you a little bit about the diagnostic criteria of the different things like placenta previa, placental abruption, vasa previa, um, and also what's um, the diagnostic criteria, what fetal, whether there'd be any fetal compromise or not, and the kind of typical presentation that's found in this. So we'll move on to the next one. So we've got a 27 year old who's 36 weeks and five days pregnant. She's been admitted to labor ward with suspected preeclampsia. The emergency buzzer goes off in her room. You're the first to attend and you find her flat on the bed having a generalized seizure. What do you do? So in this case, you are suspecting that this is now an eclamptic fit uh, because she's having a seizure and she had a history of possible preeclampsia. As with any emergency, the first thing you want to do is call for help, do your ABCs. And in pregnant women, you always do a left lateral tilt because of the risk of IVC compression if you keep them lying flat on their back due to the gravid uterus. You obviously want to protect her airway um, as you would with any um, fit in general. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to make sure that there is magnesium prepared as well. There is no point in listening in on the fetus because um, the fetus is not your main concern. It's actually the mother who's always your main concern first. So if IV access is unavailable um, during a seizure, don't try to attempt IV access. Um, so in theory, I probably should have removed that altogether. Um, but you are correct. If it's not available, then you have to use other ways like midazolam um, or even, um, uh, yeah, generally speaking, is buccal midazolam that we use or rectal diazepam. Um, if we don't have um, access for that but generally speaking we would we would want to have IV access and if she's in labor ward she would hopefully have IV access because that's one of the first things we do because the magnesium can't be given any other way so uh, the next one is a 27 year old primip she's 37 weeks and five days pregnant she's been admitted to labor ward the emergency buzzer goes off again the midwives deliver the head, but it's retracting and there's no further descent. You suspect shoulder dystocia. What do you do first? Hopefully these are slightly easier because they are emergencies that you would have hopefully covered as well. Um, so as most of you hopefully have got, um, McRoberts manoeuvre is the first thing that you do. Um, there is a very set criteria of manoeuvres you do first. And the 
the the most important one actually is McRoberts because it's the one that opens out your pelvic inlet as much as possible of all the maneuvers possible um, listed. The next one after that would be suprapubic pressure. Um, so um, this is a very nice um, display of of um, shoulder dystocia. So obviously you know that it's when the anterior shoulder of the baby becomes stuck at the pubic symphysis. So um, the head tends to kind of retract and turtleneck in. It tends to be as a result of um, macrosomia, generally speaking, related to gestational diabetes or even um, diabetes in pregnancy. Um, helper is a good way to remember um, the different maneuvers, but generally speaking, they tend to ask you about legs um so mcroberts position first thing um if you don't deliver the head quickly enough there is serious complications and consequences which can go from as um as serious as fetal hypoxia and cerebral palsy to brachial plexus injuries um as as well as perineal tears and pphs for mum fine we're almost at the end so the next question is about a 30 year old primate who attends triage at 30 weeks pregnant. She's got a history of a sudden blood stained gush of fluid um, leaking from an hour ago. She's had a constant trickle ever since. Her anomaly scan at 20 weeks showed a high anterior placenta. Her fetus is moving well and CCTG is reassuring. What's the most appropriate management plan? OK, so the correct answer here is C. The reason being that actually I know you might be thinking, could this be placenta previa? But actually, we know that she's got a high anterior placenta so that automatically most likely rules that out. It also talks about a gush of fluid. So that's very typical of, um, you know, rupture of membranes. And it's likely that she had a bloody show with this. And so that's why the question tends to be a little bit tricky and it's trying to kind of put you off um uh, kind of trick you into thinking this might be just bleeding so what you do really is you suspect that this is a preterm premature rupture of membranes or pprom um so in this case you'd want to admit this lady take bloods ensure there's iv access give steroids because she's only 30 weeks pregnant as well as antibiotics and you'd observe for the next 24 hours because a certain proportion of people will go and start laboring so start contracting but some people won't and may continue um, to be able to carry on the pregnancy till later gestations um, but you'd want to give steroids and antibiotics quite quickly and early on in case the delivery does become imminent to provide the fetus with the best opportunity um, at survival. Um, so like I said, we talked about what the diagnosis is. You may want to do something called a fetal fibronectin, which is effectively a protein that's found between um, the decidua and the chorion. And so when the two separate, it leaks through and that's what the fetal fibronectin test tests for. Um, so it would, should only really be positive if there is any evidence of um, premature rupture of membranes or a rupture of membranes of any kind. Um, you'd probably also want to get some ultrasound imaging, which will help confirm your diagnosis. So if they don't have any fluid around the baby anymore, then that kind of proves your, your, your diagnosis of a PPROM as well. Um, and the management complications are ones as listed by the RCOG guidelines as well. Um, in this case, because the woman was 30 weeks pregnant, you wouldn't necessarily consider magnesium sulfate. <laughs> 
so we'll move on. Um, now you've got another 30 year old primip with gestational diabetes. She's attended for an induction of labor. She's received four milligrams of prostaglandin gel after 72 hours, and she's currently four centimeters dilated. Four hours later, a repeat vaginal examination shows intact membranes, again at four centimeters dilated, with the fetus in an OA position with a station of plus one and no evidence of caput or molding. CCTG remains reassuring, but there's only irregular uterine activity. What would be the most appropriate next step? This is a difficult one because actually you don't tend to make these decisions as a junior. Um, but hopefully this one um, will hope is testing your um, knowledge of an induction of labor and the process of it. And that's why it's a good question to ask. Fine, so I think most people um, didn't quite get this. So the reason why it's an artificial rupture of membranes in this case is because it's asking you what's the next most appropriate step. She's four centimeters dilated and four hours later, she's still not progressed. Her CTG is reassuring and there's no evidence of kind of fetal concerns. But we do want to get the labor to continue because she's only having irregular tightenings. So the best way to do that is actually by breaking the membranes. She's four centimeters. There is a way to do it. Um, you could consider starting an oxytocin infusion, but actually before the membranes are broken, we generally tend to, you know, unless there is a contraindication to an ARM, we tend to go for an ARM first. We wouldn't go for a cat one section because there's no evidence of fetal distress. Ergometrin we only really use um, after delivery when we're trying to deliver the placenta and usually it's given with syntocin on, so it's generally called syntometrin. And she's had the maximum amount of prostaglandin gel that you can have, so giving an, an extra milligram of prostaglandin gel doesn't, doesn't actually make any sense. So progress in labor is generally speaking um, influenced by three P's. So we're talking about power, passenger and passage. In this case, actually an OA position. So occipital anterior is exactly how you'd want to have the baby at. So in terms of the actual presentation size position of the baby, it's OK. The power was what was poor because we had poor uterine activity. Um, and in case we don't really know too much about the passage just yet. The management options are ARM for women with intact membranes. If their membranes are no longer intact, then an oxytocin infusion would have been the best option. Um, and obviously instrumental deliveries and cesarean sections, we really only start talking about when um, uh, these don't, don't work. All right, next question. Apologies for that. Um, so we've got a 37 year old who's been brought in by ambulance after a home delivery of a healthy female. EBL at home was 1.5 litres and her pulse rate's 140, blood pressure of 75 over 50. You're concerned she may have some retained placenta. So what would be your immediate management process? So most people went for a manual removal of placenta, but actually, again, it's all about reading the question. The immediate management option would be the thing that's easiest to do at this point in time. You want to resuscitate this patient for obvious reasons. So she's got a 1.5 litre blood loss. She's tachycardic, hypotensive, and we know she's got retained placenta. The easiest way to actually get the retained placenta out is by trying to give um, um, is by trying to give medications that will stimulate the contractions. 
of, of the uterus. And in this case, oxytocin would be the first easy thing to do um, in her case. But yes, if an IV infusion of syntocinon does not work, you do want to head towards surgical management, which in this case, the best option is a manual removal of placenta. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and again, this um, I think this comes from the RCOG, if I'm not incorrect, um, although don't quote me on this one, but um, effectively, this is um, your four T's of a postpartum hemorrhage. The most common is tone, followed by trauma, and then trauma tissue. And then trauma, trauma. And then trauma. Um, so that's just um, to recap your four T's. We're almost at the end, I promise. Um, you've been fantastic. Um, the next one's a 25 year old woman who's presented to the GP with um, feeling anxious, worried, tearful, and she's not sleeping well five days after having delivered a baby. What's the most likely diagnosis? Okay, hey, so as most of you have guessed correctly, it's baby blues. It's too early to really be considered as postpartum depression. Um, and, you know, it's very much in keeping with the, the idea of um, kind of this low labile mood happens most prominently peaking days three to day five, whereas postpartum depression, you know, generally tends to take a little bit longer to develop. And then obviously you've got purpural psychosis, which is a psychotic disorder that occurs after childbirth. Um, and it can occur quite suddenly uh, with rapid onset. Um, and usually they will have um, fluctuations in mood, but also disturbed behavior, which is not very much in keeping with the question that we just had. Um, so this is just a small table that I've created to compare the three. Um, so hopefully it gives you an opportunity to kind of look at that at some point. The other question they tend to ask a lot about with postpartum mental health is about the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale, um, because it's something that we do in hospital, but also at six weeks postnatal check to ensure that we're screening for postnatal depression. Right, two more. So this is the first of two left. Um, so we've got a 30 year old female. She's delivered a 2.3 kilogram infant. And this was after a successful induction of labor for a small for gestational age baby. Her newborn has severe hydrocephalus, chorioretinitis, thrombocytopenia, and five days after birth, she then develops severe convulsions and unfortunately passes away. On direct questioning, she remembers having developed a flu-like illness in pregnancy, which resolved spontaneously. Which pathogen is most likely to be responsible? So this question is more alluding to the um, idea of infections in pregnancy. So hopefully I'll give you a few more seconds. This one's a kind of a, you either know it or you don't, or you try to guess most um, logically. Fine. So the answer here is CMV. Um, um, and I'll show you the reason why. So, oh God, um, yeah. So in pregnancy, um, CMV is actually the most common um, infection that you can get. Um, and congenital CMV is basically what this child was exhibiting. Although um, a lot of the um, viruses in pregnancy tend to show similar kind of um, uh, symptoms, especially rubella and CMV tend to be very similar with this. But you can see that there is some slight differences um, in 
in this. So it's a retinopathy and retinitis with um, congenital CMV. And we were talking about, um, if I remember correctly, um, a severe hydrocephalus, which I don't think is very common with um, rubella. So that's um, just for you to see the differences between the five common and infections that we talk about in the neonatal um, period um, that can be transferred from mum to fetus. But one final question. Which is very similar in um, naming, we've got a 2.3 kilogram infant who's been delivered by an SVD at term. She presents six days after her delivery with fevers and she is tachycardic. She's tender and has an erythematous right breast from which she's breastfeeding, which course of action is the best treatment, which I think you all got correct, which is blue clocksicillin and continue breastfeeding. Um, so hopefully that makes sense and doesn't really need further explanation. Um, they tend to ask about mastitis in pregnancy because you can get it in the postnatal period and it is one of those things that can attend triage quite commonly. So yeah, so some just final remarks. Um, the RCOG has some green top guidelines which are really useful, has really nice tables um, and MP is a great textbook. I used it when I was revising for my own finals, um, mainly because it was a nice little summary of things. 10 teachers is a bit more um, comprehensive. So if you want to look at things in more detail, 10 teachers is definitely a good textbook to go for. Um, Teach me OBGYN, zero to finals and past medicine are kind of your revision gold tools to have at hand. Um, so I hope that was useful. I know there were slightly more difficult questions, but um, thank you very much for listening. I hope it was useful um, information and we'll see you next time for part two. Thanks again, Aisha, for doing the session. Um, and please do fill in the feedback form. Um, I posted the link in the chat and there's a QR code on here as well. And we do leave the feedback form open with the YouTube video. So if you're watching on YouTube, please fill it in because it's always useful to get some feedback. And you'll also get access to the slides once you submit the form. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.